So welcome everyone to Straight Science and for patience with the technical difficulties tonight. Still learning the new system. So Straight Science is an evening science presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus, right here and you're in, you're in Northwest Campus and also UAF Alaska Sea Grant. So we're a NOAA, uh, national NOAA program embedded in land grant colleges. You have a, we have a lot of people in the room from uh, Hawaii actually right now. They flew up with the bird, I think. And uh, you guys also have a Hawaii Sea Grant, if you if that yeah. makes sense. Okay. So, and they're probably much more technically savvy. So tonight, it's a real pleasure. We've, we are having a returning speaker and a returning uh, researcher of Noam, you said your first um, 1988. 1988. There was a piece of paper here on the podium. Okay. Did someone take it? I did. <laughs> All right. So Wally Johnson was here in 1988 studying the Pacific Golden Plover and actually. Um, when we announced this talk, I got an email from someone and they were sending me pictures of their time on the tundra with the, the Pacific Golden Plover and Wally Johnson. So long connection with Gnome, long connection with the birds and much research. Wally Johnson is a research scientist um, with Montana State University and that's um, current. Yeah, current. current. And you're emeritus with Minnesota State University. Yeah. So Wally's gonna be our first speaker and he's going to be talking about um, the travels of this small bird of our region, the Pacific Golden Plover. And there's some gorgeous pictures coming up. So if you don't know what the Pacific Golden Plover is, you will in a minute. And it's sort of unique relationship with the Bering Strait region, because this thing seems to be able to small bird, mighty traveler. It takes off and goes to Hawaii. So I failed to mention that the, we are in the Bering Strait region. Both Northwest Campus and myself, Alaska Sea Grant, are servants of the public servants of the Bering Strait region. We serve all peoples of the Bering Strait region, which includes the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island uh, peoples. So after Wally gives us his presentation from Hawaii to Nome, and I think you'll have some updates as well. You've got right. your field work that they've been actually doing. And there's quite a lot of plover experts in the room, I think, right yeah. this minute. There are. And um, I stand corrected. <laughs> I'm sorry. Plover lovers. Plover lovers. I stand corrected. Tough crowd, but they're very patient. So, and our second speaker will be Susan Scott, and she is the Hawaiian Audubon Society's president. Yeah, and she's going to talk about her um, Colia count, and that is a sort of a citizen scientist project, uh, again, with the plover lovers of Hawaii. So we will we will learn a lot, and we're very interested. So if you want to come up. Now, this is going to be difficult because I'm running this off my computer, so I'm going to ask for the chat. I'll be standing close by, so we're going to become yeah. pals. And, um, but feel free to put things in the chat. And if you are a caller, um, feel free to speak up at any time because it is really hard to be a caller on a Zoom call because you can't raise your hand or undo your screen. So ask away. Other than that, I would say, go for it. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you very much. Take it away. We're glad to have you here. All right, thank you. Well, lots and lots of plover lovers in Hawaii, and I hope uh, also here in Nome. It's a great bird. So let's get started. I'm going to move this because you're you're on the TV over there. Oh, all yeah. Right. We want to make sure okay, we get now, you. this arrow right here is yep, not doing that's anything. It. Go for it. No, not doing it. <laughs> Why? Oh. I guess, you know, it might be taking a while. It's Just right. click on this. I'll be your hands. No one will know, but everyone watching it. Uh, in the <laughs> parlance of bird biologists, there's, there are shorebirds. Uh, shorebirds are things like plovers and turnstones and avocets. And you know, there's, here's a, a, a grouping of, of, of uh, shorebirds. 
Um, this one coming up. Oh, yeah. Um, these are among the world's greatest long distance flyers. Wonderful flyers, fast flyers. You can see a design here. This is a golden plover. Great photo of a golden plover in, in flight, by the way. Difficult to get. And look at those wings, adapted for really rapid long distance flight. Um, you, some of you probably know that there was a study on their way here in Nome, just east of Nome. Uh, I don't know exactly where, just east of Nome, but the, the bristle side, uh, the bartail godwit rather, uh, breeds here at Nome. And the bartail godwit is currently the world's record uh, long distance flyer. Now, plovers are probably doing much the same thing, but this guy can carry a little bit more equipment in terms of, of uh, tracking it. And so this was done here very recently. B6 was the particular bird that made this incredible flight. It was in the news here a couple of months ago. World record, Alaska to Tasmania in 11 days, nonstop, 8,425 8, miles. These guys are renowned for nonstop long distance flights, just like the plover. Um, friends of mine that are doing the work. Now here's a shore and here's a bird. Does that make this a shore bird? No, of course it isn't. Hey, <laughs> in the room, really stop. This is from South Africa. Uh, here's our bird, beautiful bird, right? In, go in breeding plumage, the male is a gorgeous, a gorgeous creature. And it's notable that Gabrielson and Lincoln, uh, two authors, uh, two people, uh, bird people that wrote in the birds, wrote the birds of Alaska in 1959, a notable book, talked about the golden plover as being an aristocrat <laughs> among birds. They had a great appreciation for the golden plover. And they also pointed out that the youngest birds are among the loveliest of all little chicks out there. Well, we were one of our goals with the Kalea quest was to see little guys in the nest. If you all want to stay about two more days, I think we'd make that uh, happen, but we're just a little short. We have eggs presently hatching uh, early, early in the, in, the, in the game, just little holes where the birds, are, where the chicks are working on getting out of the eggs. They probably won't make it before we depart tomorrow. The gold plover has a remarkable history. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the history of this bird. I wrote a paper about it, which I'll mention here. Second voyage of Cook, Matavai Bay, Tahiti. The discovery of the golden plover was made by Europeans. And Johan Forster and George, his son, two notable naturalists of years and years ago, made that discovery. They collected the first golden plover ever known to the world of science on 26 August. Uh, in the afternoon, 1773. The, the logs are you know, precise, the records are precise, and you can track that down. Uh, George, Forrester's, uh, George Forrester made some drawings of the bird, uh, one in uh, New Caledonia, one in Tonga on that voyage. I uh, had the experience of going to the British Museum where these are held, British Museum of Natural History in London, and actually holding these things in hand, and that was a chicken skinning experience. It, it really was neat. They'd be right there looking at these drawings. They were made by these people in that era. They're, they're held in the files in the back of the museum, of course. And well, uh, you all know that a feature out here as you go on the Teller Highway. There's Sledge Island. Cook named Sledge Island. This is the third voyage now. There are three voyages of discovery that Cook you know, made. And he saw this island, walked on this island, named the island. It reminded him, presumably, well, it, the shape of it may have reminded him of a sledge, uh, hence the name, or he might have seen an Eskimo sledge on the shoreline or something, but he named it Sledge Island. And he recorded plovers there on the 5th of August, 1778, in his, in his uh, journal. These little dots represent all of the uh, records of plovers on the Cook expeditions. So there are a number of them, and I detail those in the paper that I did. The thing about, about the Cook expedition that really catch, caught my eye was in, in mid-August 1778, I think you can see that there, he was sailing north of, of Nome, the Nome region, looking uh, and exploring up, up, up north, 
and he was observing things happening around him, and he said, "This does not this indicate that there must be, well, he was seeing birds, he was seeing migration of birds at that point, and he said, does not this indicate that there must be land to the north, where these birds retired in the proper season to breed and were now returning to a warmer climate? That's got to be the first statement of about migration in this part of the world. That's really quite an interesting uh, concept there that he, he realized what he was saying. Uh, there's the paper if anybody wants to look it up. It's, it details all of the history of this bird. And um, there's a lot of other people involved in the, in the golden plover story. You can get it online if you want to you know, look at that and get the whole, the whole treatment on with the discovery and subsequent events in the, in the early days of the golden plover. Those are the two ships, by the way, resolution and discovery. At the limits of what they could explore in this part of the world, they were about to turn around. Range of the golden plover in red, that's the breeding range, uh, the Nome region in, east, in Western Alaska would be the, uh, you know, the Eastern edge of the uh, uh, breeding range there. Most of the breeding range is in the old world in Russia, Siberia. The little dot in the middle of the screen there, it's hard to get a pointer on that. Maybe you probably see it. The little dot in the middle of the screen or the middle of the wintering range down South is where I, where, I, where I discovered the plover a long time after Cook and this group, this group did. But that's, but that's and we talk at all, Marshall Islands, that's where I ran it, first ran into the golden plover. We were down there doing uh, some other work. Oh, by the way, Anawitak, remember Anawitak? We tried to blow up that atoll at one time, that, you know, nuclear, nuclear weapons testing that occurred down there, it was a massive explosion. There were 43 tests from 1948 to 1958. Uh, this is the test, Mike, this is the first hydrogen bomb right there at Anahuita. Um, as a result of those tests that occurred at Anahuita, there's lots of money available for subsequent uh, research in one thing or another at, at, in, in that, at that site. And the University of Hawaii established a biological research station down there on Anahuita. Well, we went down there to do some other work, totally different, it had nothing to do with what, we're, what we do anymore, but it had to do with plovers, of which there were wintering plovers there on the island. And we saw them for the first time down there. Got really, uh, really interested in them because we realized that this was a bird that had to come from a long distance so it had to migrate and get there. And we found out when we started looking in the literature that there was really very, very little known about all of the travels of the Pacific Golden Plover. I won't try and review, review all of this with you, but there was one study up on St. Lawrence Island. You can see it in pink up there. A notable study by the German, a German uh, worker named Franz Sauer, who uh, documented a lot of the behavior around the nest. For example, some of which you know, some of which you have seen now, the Kaleo Quest people, and so on. And there were a few other little studies here and there that didn't amount to really a lot. Something, some things were done in Hawaii. This was all in the 70s and 60s, and even a little bit before that. But really, nothing was known. So we finished our studies there, and we talked, and we thought, why not work on golden plovers? Such an interesting bird. They've got this incredible migration. Apparently, let's get started and do some work on that. So. We started the Plover Project in 1979. Um, well, lots, of, well, lots of it has happened in Hawaii. Much of the project has been in Hawaii. On the upper right is a famous Punchbowl Cemetery that holds a wintering population of about 70 birds. That's one of our major study sites. We call it our Kaleo Lab. Uh, then in Alaska, we started working in 1988 and have been up there almost every year since doing various things, trying to learn as much as we can about the biology and ecology of the bird, and tracking its migrations and so on. So that's kind of a little background. We did a lot of color banding in the 80s. Uh, we did VHF radios in the 90s, trying to get information on where the birds were going and how they were getting there. You don't learn a lot about, tra about the birds um, about tracking the birds with just bands because it requires somebody to see them and report them. You know, if, if we do it and band a bird in Hawaii, somebody sees it in Alaska, maybe, <laughs> but, but the chances of it are pretty slim. But with radios, you can, you know, do get some information with radios as to where the birds are going. Well, let's kind of look at some of that. From color banded birds, however, 
from color banded birds, you can study territoriality, you can study site faithfulness, you can do longevity studies, you can do a lot of things with just plain color bands, and we did all that. Um, that bird, uh, well, let me back up for just one second if I can. I don't know if it works. It may not. That one bird that I was just going to comment about there was is the oldest known plover uh, ever, the oldest known Pacific golden plover that anyone has ever died. Oh, good. Thank you. On the left, a uh, 21-year-old bird, uh, and that's a color-banded bird. So you can get that kind of information just by color banding with specific combinations so that you have individuals identified. The other bird is a female, a male on the left, female on the right. The bird on the left uh, was named Gertrude by, a, uh, by a, an attendant in the Punchbowl Cemetery who had a particular fondness for that bird. She lived to be about 12. Um, territoriality uh, in Hawaii, uh, when they get there, many of the birds claim territories and they reclaim them when they get back. In other words, they establish a territory, they migrate, they get back and the, for wintering again, and they reclaim the same territory again. It's remarkable. They home right back into the same plot of ground, like in the cemetery and elsewhere in Hawaii. And a lot of that involves uh, fighting between two birds, posturing between two birds, various kinds of displays that is, Tell tell one bird to tell you know one bird is telling the other bird basically where what what space is you know get out of my space that kind of thing. Oh yeah, here's that bird. Twenty one years three months world record. And one of the things you learn about with these little guys once you, once they become individuals is that they are very adaptable. They're able to coexist with people very nicely. Uh, then that's a major, major plus these days in terms of competing with humans and other activities and so on. In a place like Hawaii, there's a bird that territory includes a miniature golf course, for example. Now, there's an entirely different bird out here on the tundra, but when they get to Hawaii in the wintering period, they, their personality changes. We can't do that on the tundra, can we? Wouldn't that be nice? We, we, there's a bird out here that we've been trying to catch. Uh, well, we spent all afternoon trying to catch it. Um, anyway, you can train a bird. Some people have done this in Hawaii to feed from your hand. I've and, come across coming to camp. See some here and there. Here and gamble. Thank you, Orlin. <laughs> Yep, and uh, I'm here at camp, and I think I saw, might have saw some, mostly in the fall time and spring, I think. So. All right, so he sees them mostly in the fall time and spring. Uh -huh. Gamble. Exactly. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you, Orlin. Yep, yep. Yep. Some places in the Pacific, uh, you can actually uh, uh, feed flocks of plovers like this, which, of course, is unheard of in an area like we're in here. They don't behave the same way. This is at, at the Johnston Island, remote island in the Pacific. All right. Is that working now? Mm -hmm. It's just, I think, because it's running off this, it's a little delayed. With VHF radios, we got the first clues as to where Hawaii plovers were breeding in Alaska, and that was the Alaska Peninsula and the Lake Clark region. And with color banded birds, again, another example of something that we that we 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 uh, learned from a color banded individual, which is kind of interesting. We got a, a note from a or an email from a person who was an observer on a fishing boat out in the, uh, at the, where the little red dot is down there in the Bering Sea. And one day a plover landed on that ship, on that boat, and was so tired, so tired, hard to imagine a plover being so tired that you can look, just go and pick it up. So you've got to be totally exhausted, totally out of fuel. You know, as the bird would have to be really, really in tough shape to be able to actually pick it up. Took it in his cabin, Held it there for a overnight. This was a foggy, foggy situation. The bird was in a fog. They were in dense fog at the time. Next morning, released it, and it eventually flew off. This is bird banded in on Oahu. And uh, 
unfortunately never never got back to its territory so we don't know what happened to that bird now that bird could have been a member of a flock maybe a number of other birds perished that night but at least this one made it to the boat but we don't know what else was going on out there source of mortality bad weather Then the newest thing, um, geolocators, we started using them in 2010 and through, through about 2015, and GPS tags. These kinds of things now can really pinpoint where birds are going, when they get there, how they get there, and so on, tracking. Um, geolocators are little devices. You can see there, it's on a leg of this bird. It's attached to a, to a band, a plastic band, and that in turn is attached or you know, affixed around the leg. So the bird is carrying this little thing. Geolocator records records uh, day length or uh, uh, well, essentially day length every five minutes or up to long for long periods of time, up to a couple of years. And it stores that information in that little device, and then you can get that little take that little device and download it into a computer, and the computer can figure out where the bird had to be in order to see those that that pattern of, of, of day length. The downside of that, do you see what the downside of that might be? You got to recover the bird. You got to get the bird back. Well, plovers, being very sight faithful, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a, in a second. You can do this reasonably well with plovers. Lots of birds you couldn't do this at all with. Of course, they, they disappear and you don't never see them again. But plover is a pretty reliable source of information with the data logging. GPS tags, ah, even better. Because the GPS tag, you don't have to re retrieve the bird for that one. It's broadcasting the satellites. The satellite's getting the information. The satellite's in turn telling us where the bird is. So that's a pretty neat system. So we're doing nowadays... A lot with GPS tags. Going forward Oops. would be this one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got it. Well, in a nutshell, the bird is a perfect experimental animal for the kinds of things that you are that we're trying to do in terms of tracking. It's a relatively bird a tame bird. Although the one is difficult, but Color rates devices like data loggers and, and so on. Males and females are sight faithful on the wintering grounds. Males and females come back to the very, very same places each year on the wintering grounds. Males are sight faithful on the nesting grounds. So if you want to study migration from like Alaska, from the Alaska end, you, you, want, to, you want to put your tags on males and then they'll be back again to that very same site again the following year where you can recover them or whatever. Uh, high survival rates, very high survival rates for these birds. We found that in a nutshell here that the birds from Hawaii are all breeding in roughly this region of Alaska, uh, kind of from Bethel southward on the Alaska Peninsula. And just to diagram something, these, these records uh, birds migrating southward in late August from from Alaska to Hawaii a lot of jiggle a lot of jiggles in the lines as to where the birds birds were when they were you know when the data was loaded into the logger no doubt wind effects birds can't necessarily fly an absolutely straight line from point A to point B so we get some kind of jiggling in there and then late April 25th or so of April they migrate northward in yellow shown in yellow all nonstop all non-stop stuff. There's no place to land out there. Way plovers, about 3,000 mile migration non-stop to and from Alaska. Speed is about 40 miles an hour on average, but highly variable. You get a tailwind, then things really speed up. Uh, we have records that suggest about 100 miles an hour in a very favorable tailwind, so they can really cruise. Non-stop flight about three to four days. But you go south of Hawaii, things change. South of Hawaii, and this is a, a well, this is based on a number of studies that we've we've done. But some of these birds are Alaska birds, and others are from other places. But in the in the grand scheme of things, south of Hawaii, we get this big roundabout migration cycle. The birds go southward um, through the mid Pacific, more or less, the the purple lines. 
to various wintering grounds. And then in the spring, the bluish lines take them to Japan and from Japan back to Alaska. Apparently, uh, you have to refuel when you're that far south. It's very difficult for the bird to get from all the way from the lower part of this winter range back to Alaska nonstop, you know, one way. So these flights, these individual flights are nonstop, but there are three segments to it. Different than the Hawaii birds. They get up here, conditions are somewhat unknown when they arrive. You know, you can have bad snow situation, uh, food might be a little bit skippy. And so they got to get, the, they have to arrive here with some fat. Uh, some reserve, some reserves in the tank, and they acquire that in Japan. Japan is a vital stopover for birds that are coming here to this region of the, of the of breeding range. Not so vital when you go south. That's a more predictable situation, but it's unpredictable when you come to the northern end of this range. So plovers wintering beyond Hawaii, four to 7,000 miles, uh, these flights, uh, speed and wind assist about the same as, as uh, Hawaii birds. Nonstop flights about 48 days. We have one bird that may have flown from here to Australia in 10 days, but it was a little iffy, but it, it probably happened. Similar to the Bartail garden. Nesting grounds then, our studies indicate that the nesting grounds of Hawaii plovers are to the south, the, the uh, pinkish area and west nesting grounds of birds wintering south of Hawaii are the yellow areas up there, Seward Peninsula, the Yukon Delta and so on over into Russia. Separation of the two wintering grounds. Where do known plovers go in winter? Um, I have a number of birds here represented on this little graphic. Uh, uh, well, they've been all over the Pacific, really. Uh, Marshall Islands, uh, Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, uh, all the way to Fiji and Queensland, Australia. We have birds out here in Woolly Lagoon that winter in Queensland, Australia. We had one in Sulawesi, which was kind of an interesting one. Um, this guy, I kind of have to follow this. It's a little difficult. The point is not going to work. Um, there's a number one up there in Alaska, that's where he was caught out here, you know, here in Nome. He took off in the fall and made that big arcing migration or the big arcing movement across the whole Pacific over Okinawa, number two there. So that was one big nonstop flight. And it's incredible, isn't it? That kind of a thing. Over to Okinawa, from Okinawa down to Sulawesi, over here, there. From Sulawesi in the spring, he wintered to Sulawesi. In the spring, up across over into uh, number seven over there into the border between China and Russia, and then over across to number eight, which took him over into the Bering Sea. And in the Bering Sea region, apparently ran into really bad weather, turned back. See that little turning back there over to Chukotka. Finally came from Chicago across, got back here to Nome. We couldn't fly in. <laughs> but that was, that's a 17,000 mile trip for that bird. That was the GPS? That was, that, pardon me? GPS? GPS, yeah, yeah. There he was in, whoops. There he was in Sulawesi. Right there, <laughs> all winter, rice fields, wintering in an agricultural uh, field, on agricultural field. And it's certainly not the only bird doing it. I mean, that was one individual that was tagged and we could follow it, but there must be others here in, the, in this region, in the Nome area that are doing the same thing. Okay, so we've got two big systems then, Hawaiian Islands, direct migration, nonstop, and south of Hawaii, a big arcing arrangement. Japan, vital, can't emphasize too much Japan. These are all individual birds that we've tracked to Japan in the spring from south of Hawaii, and they're in rice fields. And if we can get this to work, which this is crossed. kind of a neat one. This is from Japan, uh, YouTube. Where? Probably loading, because that's a film. 
and we're running it off your USB. Yeah. Any questions at this point? This I know a, I have a couple. This is a nice one. Go ahead. Road, we weren't able to track that coverage of one, so about 70,000 miles of gain subsequent years. That was um, 2018, I think. Do you have any sign of it in subsequent years? Uh, no. No. So do you have any idea if he did that intentionally or why would he go all the way to Hawaii before he turned right to Probably winds, weather. Yeah. All right. So here we go. But he wouldn't have been going to Hawaii in the first place because he presumably because he, he knew the he knew we wanted to be south. Away so it's gonna work. Here we go. It is. Here right. we go. Ready? And help me turn it off. I don't want to show the whole thing. Okay. This is what happens in Japan in the during the migration period. This is springtime, you know, in the in the area of Japan where plovers are fairly common now. In the spring, interesting behavior. You don't you know you don't see anything like this in Hawaii, for example. Blocks of plovers wheeling around. Did you see that in Nome? You don't see that in Nome. <laughs> And they are using uh, rice fields. The agricultural system presently in Japan is such that the springtime rice planting and cultivation of rice paddies and so on coincides beautifully with the migration of the bird. This has been going on for you know centuries. So they find lots of in invertebrates, worms and other things in the rice fields, and that's what they're fattening up on for that next se next segment of the flight, which will carry them back to Alaska and portions of Siberia as well, of course. What sex are we looking at here, males? There's a nice female. So anyway, the idea of rice field, plover, migration, really a critical relationship. Let's stop, there. stop there? Yeah. OK, thank you. Well, we did a GPS thing uh, in 2023. I just kind of finished that up here this last uh, migration season in the spring. And uh, those blue dots are new records uh, using GPS uh, and included with the red records, which are previous study, uh, studies. And again, they all, they all indicated breeding in that southerly region here of Alaska, Alaska Peninsula. But notice a couple, couple of most three of them, but they're a little, a little further north than usual. Those, up, those upper three are a little further north than we've ever seen before. These are birds from the Punchbowl Cemetery in Honolulu, in terms of the, those blue dots, it's tracked by GPS this last spring. Uh, one kind of interesting bird in the Punchbowl this last spring, number uh, in our record keeping, number one in section I of the Punchbowl. Um, this is on this is October 8th, 22 that we're seeing him. Um, that bird made this kind of a of a move here. Okay, come back. Are you going? I'm, I want to go back. I want to go back. One more? Yeah. That bird, you know, you, you, you really don't know what these birds are up to unless you have a tag on them, obviously, that's giving you the information as to where in the world they are. And this was kind of a surprise. This guy, there's this in red, the red dot is the Punchbowl Cemetery, basically, and, and the northward migration is on the right there, that long line going up north. It wouldn't be a straight line, it would be jiggling around with winds and whatnot. But it goes, the bird goes up to, um, well, roughly the area around Iliamna, I think it was, and we thought that was going to be where it was going to nest. And stayed there for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks or something like that, and then apparently had a nest failure or couldn't find a mate or something, and decided to check out Russia. So we made a westward, westward shot across and went over into Chukotka, spent a couple of weeks there, decided maybe Russia wasn't so good either. 
came back to Alaska, then migrated south, the line on the far right, the far left there, came, came back and came back southward and wound up at Necker Island, which is one of the small windward, one of the small islands to the, in the Hawaiian chain north of Oahu, or northwest of Oahu, about 465 miles from Punchbowl Cemetery. Stayed there for a couple of months. We'd had no, we thought we'd lost this bird. The signals began to cut out. We thought we'd probably lost them. And then finally turned up, tail end bird, finally turned up back on his very same territory, bing, right back there in the punch bowl. So <laughs> there he was after a long, long flight, 8,000 miles of flight. So that's him, good old number one. He recaptured, we're gonna take his GPS tag off which we're doing right there. That's the tag. And we snipped the little harness, took it off. Interesting bird. Oops. There's the tag, pardon? See any little, it's a very thin monofilament, a stretchable monofilament. And you put that around the uh, legs, and this actually becomes a kind of a fanny pack. It's not really a backpack, it's more of a fanny pack. Well, let's go out here in the immediate area and talk a little bit more about the things in, in Alaska. Um, all of you have had this experience. You see the nest. <laughs> And how easy it is to potentially step on one, step on a nest. Very, very good. Camouflage is superb, of course. And I've never, we've never stepped on one. Yeah, but you have to be careful. Nice bird, beautiful bird. A lot of display and calling, you know, alarm calling around the nest. When they realize that you're there, they think you're a big predator. So they go through all kinds of antics to try and fool you. Beautiful nest, huh? Gorgeous. And notice the uh, all the lichens involved in the in the nest. The, the males make the nest. They with their feet they scrape and they form a, a shallow what we call a scrape. And with their breast and belly they move around. They, they they create a little hollow on the on the surface of the ground. And then and they they pull in lichens and bits of bits of other plant, like plants and so on. And we wind up with something like this. And remember, males are very sight faithful. So we've got nests out there from year to year that a bird makes. And interestingly enough, they sometimes reuse them. They come back and, well, here's the spot that I've been before and I'll use it again. So sometimes that happens, not often, but it sometimes does happen. And sometimes uh, another bird, a different bird will see this thing that was created the previous season or a couple of three seasons before because they last a long time on the tundra. These, are, these persist on the tundra for long periods of time, these, these nest bowls and we'll take it over and use it. And we've had American golden plovers um, use the nest a couple of times, then a Pacific, same nest cup. Then back with an American <laughs> for a couple of times, then a, then a Pacific again, that kind of thing. Alternating, yeah. alternating species. There was also, the, we didn't talk about it, but American golden plover out here as well. So we get that kind of interesting interplay of the two species with their nest cups. Those are Thamnolia lichens, by the way. Inter that's an important component. Those stringy lichens are Thamnolia lichens. Very, they always, almost always use those in the construction of the nest. Lots of interesting displays around the nest. Spread wing display. They show you all their feathers there. Kind of neat. Female, pretty bird too, huh? Female showing a spread wing kind of thing. And the chicks, which <laughs> yeah, it might be too, just two days too late. Can you see this little knobby thing? That's an ankle. Ankles. Thank you. The legs on these chicks are quite large. You can put adult bands on a chick, no problem. They're very precocial, very active. They run around scurrying, feeding themselves. Like little chickens. Very pretty. Lots of interaction like this. 
uh, they have to return to their parent for brooding. Uh, they, you know, they go out and forage for a few minutes. It's usually kind of cold, chilly. They, they, they're, they're not, they're, they're in a good thermal regulation when they're just little bitty chicks. So they come back and get brooded and warmed up, go out and forage again for a while, come back to mom or dad, get brooded. And when they are about, when they gain about half their body mass, their, th their thermal regulation is improved enough that they don't have to do this. But for a period of time, they've got to rely on their parents to get warmed up. This, by the way, by the way was a nest at Woolly Lagoon, right next to the road, right practically on the road. And so you could lean out of the car window and there they were. Great. Little guy. Uh, a bird that's probably five or six days old, something like that. Look at that wing. Now that wing has to mature so that bird can be a nonstop flyer to Hawaii or someplace or wherever it's going in about 28 days. And wow. it's not going to leave in 28 days, but it's got to mature so it can, you know, fly, fledge, can fly. Extremely rapid growth in these guys. And they're eating, you know, constantly uh, daylight. You know, and so lots of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are one of the major major foods. Asynchronous hatching, and that happens because asynchronous, meaning they don't all hatch at once, and that happens because the, the, the female lays an egg, does not start to incubate, lays the second egg. There's always four eggs in the clutch. Uh, lays the second egg, still doesn't start to incubate. Lays the third egg maybe starts to warm things up there a little bit now. Maybe maybe warming a little bit with the second egg, but not really incubation. And then the fourth egg is laid and they go into full incubation. Well, numbers one, two, and three before number four have had a little bit of warming. They're, they're started, they've just barely started. And then four comes along and it's full-fledged incubation now. So not every egg is equally incubated. That's what I'm saying. There's a sort of a gradient. So you get this asynchronous, asynchronous hatching. So the one that hatches first has got to be number one. And then as you go down and get the other three, that indicates the, you know, the spacing between when incubation actually started. So right now, the little guys out here at a nest that we're, where we're trying to catch one of the birds have, have teeny little holes in each egg. They're working on it. They're going to come out and uh, they'll, they'll be coming out in a sequence of time for all the individuals. When they do come out, um, and you see the little, little guy in the lower right, they, they're not very, very attractive at that point, but they dry off and the little down feathers pop out and they get fluffy and beautiful. Notice the uh, egg there, the eggshell, the interior of the egg where one is hatched. That would be a predator's signal, wouldn't it? So the adults pick those up and they fly off with them and throw and they release them at some distance from the nest. We've seen that. We've seen that happen a number of times. Been a neat, a neat system. Well, do all four eggs always hatch, or is there sometimes a bad egg? Uh, I've never seen a bad egg. <laughs> no, always seem to be four. No, no. They're pretty good at that. Future of the Colea. Well, well, let's think about it, a few angles there. Uh, in the immediate future, Colea <laughs> would be a possible predation. Um, I mean, that's that, and that's then this is sort of normal stuff. I mean, they, they, they're all confronted with this kind of thing. Here's a fox, you know, might take the young young birds or the eggs or whatever. We did, we didn't see a parasitic figure. I don't think. Did we see a parasitic figure? We said it's all out of the long tail variety. That that's a pretty sturdy predator right there that would love to take the chick. Or uh, this this from a friend in in, um, in Russia. There's a, a big raven on the left. It's the same bird, but two different photos. The raven, on, the, the photo on the left, the guy is looking at the nest. Aha, uh -huh, he's looking at this nest. Photo on the right, he's just picking, he's about to take it. He's going to come back and get all of them, of course. So that's another risk. But again, that's that's nature. Or if you get a big herd of uh, grazing animals of some kind, like reindeer or caribou, if they go across an area where there are nests, you're going to lose the nest. I mean, it's just going to happen. There's so many foot feet out there. They're going to either hit the nest 
And if they do find one, as they graze along, they'll eat the eggs. So that kind of thing is very tough on ground nesting birds if you've got a lot of those animals in the area. The real problem is uh, climate. What's going to happen with that? And that's, uh, can you read that? A shrubification on the right. As the, as the tundra warms up, uh, plants will grow taller. And that, that can be demonstrated with a little mini greenhouse kind of a thing. When that happens, then the habitat changes totally and the plovers obviously can't use it. So that's a shrubification business, tough on ground nesting shorebirds. And the other thing on the right, I don't know if you can read it, synchrony with insects. Um, if, it's, if, if you've got it, the, the, the birds have to be in, in sync with insect populations in order for the young to survive and so on. And if that gets out of sync because of climate, the different warming cycle with the, with the weather as opposed to the migration cycle, then you can get in trouble. And that's just a little uh, paper that came out with authors from all over the world, really, in, in that string of authors. They're all pointing these things out. So we don't know where it's going. We hope that uh, you know, the plover's going to be around for a good length of time yet. But one of the things about the plover, the golden plover, they uh, frequent the uplands um, uh, more than most shorebirds. Many, many other shorebirds require shore um, estuarine coastal environments in order to feed, migrate, stopovers, and so on. Um, one of the key stopovers for Pacific golden plovers could be, but isn't, <laughs> could be the Yellow Sea region. The Yellow Sea region is one of the most important shorebird migration stopover sites in the world, but not for plovers. Plovers are in the uplands, like in the rice fields and, and that kind of thing. The, the, the shorebirds that use the, the Yellow Sea are in danger. We're talking about godwits and knots and various other you know, kinds of shorebirds. In that environment, they're in trouble because those those areas of, of the Yellow Sea that they've been using for countless years are being developed by China and other, other purposes. They're disappearing. And so being an upland type shorebird, which is kind of contradictory in a way, but they're, they're in the uplands. And that's a big factor for as far as plovers are concerned. Anyway, lots and lots, lots of sources of uh, funding for this project over the years. There's a whole list of things here, a whole list of uh, sponsors and funders and whatnot that uh, were vital to the work that we did and still are doing some of. Uh, so many people have assisted in this project. Everybody, uh, uh, well, <laughs> just a jillion people. This is only a small a part of the whole. A lot of some of them in our room here. <laughs> And uh, notice you can't you can't help smiling when you're holding a plover. It's just an automatic response. You can't you can't you can't help smiling. <laughs> thank you for all thank you to all those good helpers. Okay, questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, while you're doing questions, I'm gonna be behind okay. the scenes right. here. Yeah. yeah. Thank. And before we start with the questions, um, know that at this time, this is when it's a good time for the street science audience, if you're, because we really got into being online during the pandemic, and we have a great audience, and this is the time to be, when you're thinking of your question, be sure to give our speaker some love in the chat box. So that's Wally Johnson. And um, we do have a question in the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing, or at least get out of the... This is interesting to drive this like this. The chat, the first question, and I'll just go for the chat, and I don't see any callers yet, but Doug says, as described, there appears to be two distinct populations. Are they genetically distinct? Do they overlap to some degree on the breeding ground to allow swapping genes between the two populations? They do overlap in the known uh region potentially, although that separation is pretty sharp. We do get, you know, this, we have had a very, very few of the more southerly Hawaii type birds show up further north. Um, pretty well separated, pretty well separated. And no one's really went, done, done any genetic studies on the two populations. All right, now take it away, because I think we're stopped in the chat. 
Yeah. Okay. The nails are nesting site cages. Yes, they are. So they come back to their nesting site and they have to attract yep. a female, yep. not necessarily the same girl. And I did actually, I should mention that the, the, the girls come and and they 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 they, 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 they don't usually mate with the same oh. male twice. Oh. We've had them mate with the same male twice, but it's atypical. They get here, there seems to be a little separation in time. The males get here a little bit ahead, maybe a day or two ahead of the female. Females come in and they're looking now for a guy that has really good snow free territory. Probably there's still snow around in there. Looking for a guy with a good territory that would provide adequate food. You know, they're, they're laying four eggs that are equivalent to their, to their body weight. 25 gram eggs, the female weighs, so it's a little over 100 grams fat free. And so that's a huge investment that the female has to make. So she's somehow selecting a, a suitable territory, with probably with the first bacon male that she finds, and then oftentimes, usually, somebody else. Now, we have had them pair up again, but very seldom. Does males exhibit any grooming behaviors? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And, okay. and the initial behavior, much of the initial okay. behavior is airborne. They make these okay. wide ranging okay. flights so that teaching recall, which unfortunately we wouldn't be able to bring straight well. We need to be here like the first week of June, and then we get a lot of that. And they're calling and flying very slowly around, so that you know, the okay. meandering flights they indicate roughly where the territory is until we try to male. Thanks. You did a good job. Which means, of course, that since she's not mating with the same individual each time, that there's, uh, well, the female is basically playing the field. The male is right here, but, but never, never really together again. And also, when they are together, when they, when they do mate, she often, very often, every day, when, when well, back in, he's on the nest during the day, usually, typically on the nest during the day. She's typically on the nest during the night. During the day, the female is often nowhere to be seen. You can go out there and look for a female during the day, and you can't find her. She may be one or two miles away someplace. Oh. Extra care of paternity. What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry. The female's out there and apparently occasionally mates with another male somewhere else and comes back to male number one, but not his kid. Yeah. yeah. What about the young? Even the birds. Uh, once they had the chicks in those days, and they fly back, and they have those chicks in the days, and then they young. Yes, the adults. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the, the female, there's kind of a whole series of things that happen. The females do seem to leave earliest. Let's say it's uh, the end of the breeding season and fall is coming out. Females will start to migrate uh, early on. Then the males can kind of hang on and will kind of look for the younger birds and so on. A lot of the young guys are uh, maturing, they're trying to, you know, they're, they're gaining weight, they're gaining strength to go for the migration and so on. Then the males leave. Now we've got nothing but young birds left. Oh, they now have all the food, however, which, you know, they're, they're, they're now. In a, series, in, in a situation with perhaps more food, more intake, which is desirable for them at this point, then they finally leave, usually October sometime. At least in, in Hawaii, they arrive in, during October and early November. Yeah, and that's yeah. all, if that's all not, that's all the, the first flight is totaling without mom yeah. and dad. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my, quick, my quick question is when they do that long flight, are they flapping or are they just locking their wings everybody and just said, catch that, that quick, catch that wing? Everybody thinks that they're flapping. However, that no one really knows the answer to that question. If they get into a good wind, why not just hold your wings up? Yeah, and travel with it. Can they lock up a little bit? Lock up a little, like a like a albatross. Or Nobody's something. ever observed that. Okay. You know, and you know, they let the wind take them, move that. them, huh? Yeah, that that was my question, Orlin. Was do they those little birds flap it the whole way, you know, and just catch the wind, or are they just catch a good wind and then kind of hold and sort of sail on down? I have seen yeah. boy for short distances. Okay, but I, I don't know. Yeah, Orlin had written they're really one strong bird, fly thousands yeah, yeah. and thousands of miles. I mean, that is something, isn't it? Yeah. That all yeah. the way down. Yeah. 
I was trying to I was trying to see if I could see any while I'm I'm here at camp right now. I have my <laughs> RV Starlink with me. Yeah, so, awesome. Yeah. I wasn't able to see any of the smaller ones. I don't know what they're called. Some kind of sandpiper. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. There's those. You know, those are our own. Quick question for you, Orlin. What's the is there a Yupik word for this Pacific golden plover? Mm. Probably is. I haven't I'll ask when I get back in town. Okay. I'll ask some of that. Yeah, Oh, what was that? Akabak? What is it? The sandpiper? The so, Pacific. Oh, oh, go ahead. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. Hi, Susan. This is um, Gay, the Pacific Golden Plover. Oh, okay. Yeah. I Maybe I forgot. Okay. Not one you're probably normally talking about, but okay. I'll look it up later and I'll I'll let you know. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll have to look it up somewhere. Um are the Japanese farmers supportive of um I think that's a whole area that needs some work. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to get over there and really start looking and see to see what's happening. If there are any changes in the agricultural routine over there, it could really mess things up. And we ought, to, we ought to start learning more about that. You know, a lot of good bird people in Japan, you know, but no, but no one, to my knowledge, is really exploring those mm -hmm. things. How to do that? It's so it's so critical. To leak, I think I just looked it up. I, it might be, but I'll ask some oh, really? one of the older people when I get back home. To leak. Oh, oh, yeah, there, there. Either to read and to read, but the bigger ones are to read. Oh, yeah, it could be to read, to read, but are the way we call them. To read. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Interact mm. here, or do they are they in the same territory? Or There's a lot of people here. Together on the chosen territories. The American Golden Clover needs a high. Um, rocky slopes for nesting. The Pacific Golden Plover is more favored by lower or more um, wet vegetation, taller vegetation. Not really tall, but I mean taller vegetation. Yeah. So there's a separation in terms of the kind of habitat that the two birds use, but they can be close, but that can be close together. You know, it's a slope coming down, you can have an American on it, and down here you've got a Pacific. So, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we've got a million. These are nesting areas right by the river, the one that we oh, yes. pretty much follow. Yeah. Is there any lore from the King Islanders since there's summer camps right there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, would date, that would date back as far as Catherine could. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, down at Woolly Lagoon, it used to be. Uh, relatively few America, a, a few plovers breeding on the along the road, you know, down where they're going. And now they're pretty common. This seems to be kind of a switch. So, so something has happened there that more plovers down on Woolly Lagoon than before. And some of that environment on Woolly Lagoon looks like it should be American golden plover habitat. It's very, very low, very it's rocky, some of that. And there are Pacifics in there, which Sort of violates the rule of where the, you know, the habitat selection that you typically see. Have you ever caught one mating yeah. with the other? Lingering with the other? No, never have. Although it's been reported in Russia, um, we never have. An American made it was a Pacific. You have a question. When they're doing the migration over, do they usually do it solitary or in a group of small? I, th I think it's usually a group thing. I have seen a solitary bird in Hawaii, but up, 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 up and away, but probably joining another flock somewhere along the way. But I think it's typically a group thing. So, what happens to an individual? It could be happening to a group like that one in the Bering Sea. Here's this. He may see this terribly tired out bird landing on a boat. He's probably not out there alone. And there, there might have been a number of other birds there that 
perished, died in a foggy situation. Forty to hundred miles an hour in a. Yeah, forty is kind of an average. You know, a <laughs> hundred very occasional, but they can do it. Yeah, yeah, Paul. Have you sussed out um, altitude data from the GPS? No stuff. No, we're still no. We haven't. I assume it's a favorable wind kind of a thing. We get up just to, to where you're in a favorable wind situation, and that's what you're going to see. And you're probably going to modify it, you know, with the winds. So the birds never land. They don't like the water. It's a bit low, but it, it, you can get water water. The plumage is not really good for an aquatic situation. Mm -hmm. And if they did land on the, you know, if you're flying along nonstop, let's say, and you decide, oh, well, I think I'll land, it's going to take energy to get back up again. You know, so once you're up there, you might as well stay up there because you're probably going to you know, use more energy to, in the process of landing someplace. My last question is so, and you may have covered this, but so if you have males with supersite fidelity and females with supersite fidelity, Although it sounds like she's gets around a little bit. It's site it's, fidelity, super site fidelity on the wintering grounds. Oh, on the wintering grounds. Not, okay. on the, not on the breeding grounds. All right, not on the breeding grounds. All right, you answered that. Thanks. No. All right. So with that, let's get the next speaker's presentation up. Share screen. All right. All right. So okay, thank you. Thanks. We've got Susan. She's coming up to the podium. It's these buttons right here. <laughs> and um, um, she'll be talking about more of what they're doing in Hawaii with the plover. And thank you so much. And I, um, this is forward. And mm -hmm. back. Okay. Well, thank you for having us our uh, Hawaii Audubon Society. Four of our board members are here on this Kolea Quest. My background is marine biology. And for 32 years, I wrote a weekly column for the Honolulu Daily Newspaper called Ocean Watch. And while I was um, in the 90s, early 90s, I started in the late 80s. In the early 90s, people started asking me questions about the Kolea. And so I didn't know anything about the shorebirds at the time. I knew more about seabirds than shorebirds, but someone clipped a, uh, my column out of the newspaper, sent it to Wally in Bozeman. And then Wally wrote me back letters, this was before email, with a copy of his study that answered the question. And so we did that for some time. And so the more I wrote, the answers to the questions, the more people asked me questions. <laughs> and so finally, when Wally came to Hawaii, he invited me to come uh, help him ban some birds. That was the 21 year old bird at Bellows Air Force Base. And so once you've held a bird, a little Kalea, you're in love forever with the, with the species. They're so wonderful to be able to have one in your hand. So that became more and more of my, um, my own quest is to learn more about Kalea. And then Wally and I finally met. And I, I laugh at this um, heading that I made for this talk that I give about the Kalea count that we did because as a, as a good writer, you don't want to use adjectives. But we always use all these adjectives for all of our Kalea because they're much, much loved in Hawaii. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Maybe. All right. Let's see what we got. Let's try this. Try it again. One and done. There we go. Great. So the the Kalea that you we we all call them Kalea. Hardly anybody calls them plovers in Hawaii, but the Kalea you see here are really different color than what we are live with in Hawaii. And this is our, um, this is our winter. Uh, can we get the, I have the captions covered on this. No, you can see it, you see? Oh, I can, I can't see. Okay, I'll oh, just look here. All right. So the Kalea is the Hawaiian word for one who takes and leaves. 
So the, the ancient Hawaiians knew a lot about the Kalea. They ate them, they trapped them and ate them. And they noticed that they came in the, in the late summer and fall, they, they got fat and then they left. So they named them Kalea and they called people who took and left a Kalea. And so in the, win in the winter, this is what we see uh, throughout the Hawaiian islands. And the males and females look alike. That's a question people ask me often of how do, how do I don't know how do I know if I have a male or female in my in my yard? And then in the spring, when they start molting and changing color, it's a really exciting time. I am just inundated with emails about my Kalea is changing color. One one person wrote me a, an email and said, uh, I had a bird in my yard all winter and now I have a different bird, but they didn't fight. And so I think it's probably the same one molting and, and changing color. And in the spring, in, in the spring, the females always have speckled breasts. So they, there's always some speckle. The males are solid black. So that's how I tell people they can tell if they have a male or female. Uh, we call them shorebirds, but uh, they're very, very rarely on our beaches in Hawaii. This was one of the rare times I was walking on the North Shore Beach and I saw two, uh, two birds there. But uh, mostly they, they, um, they love our lawns. They love grass. And we have so many, much grass and golf courses and parks and places in Hawaii that they love to forage in. We've also introduced almost everything they're eating with these earthworms and cockroaches and spiders. All those are introduced and they, they, they love that too. So yeah, Wally uh, started in 1979. The, his Plover project and invited me to come to uh, Nome five years ago to see what was going on here because he and I had had worked together for some time and all these questions that people asked we finally said well let I'm a popular science writer and Wally has done this research for 50 years on these uh, birds let's put this together collaborate together and write a book so people can look up the answers themselves and get their own answers to the to the uh, their questions about the birds. And so that's what we've done. And pretty much everything everybody knows about the Kalea is from Wally's research and this book that we, we University of Hawaii Press published. So, th so that's been really a fun project for us. Even with all of these years of research, there's still a lot of questions that no one can answer. Uh, that as you know, Wally said, I don't know. And I say the same thing, a lot of things we don't know. And one is um, people say to me, there, there aren't, don't seem to be nearly as many Kalea in our park uh, as last year, are they increasing bee species? We, we don't know that because we don't know how many Kalea spend the winters there. And so you can't tell if they're increasing or decreasing if you don't have any baseline to, to tell. And the, so I looked into this and thought, what, do we, did we ever know? And in 1949, the state did account for the, all of the islands, the main Hawaiian islands, and got 74,000. And I don't know how they got that number. Uh, I couldn't really find out who did what. It was a state count. But it's interesting that they call them game birds. So they were still uh, hunting them up until 1941. They were shooting 15 a day for food, but they tell us that they went way over that number, uh, uh, hunters did. And so the numbers really were decreasing. And there was some alarm about that. So they stopped the hunting. And then in 1941, at the beginning of World War II, they never started it again. So the hunting's been banned since 41. And then in 68, um, the state did another count in uh, just Oahu only and got 1,000. But it's interesting that they were still calling them game birds in 1968 when they hadn't been hunted. This was a study I found since 41. So, so as a mindset, you know, to get over that these are birds you're going to shoot and eat. So um, 1992 was the best real count that we got of any buffers. And that was when Wally came to Hawaii and he counted all the golf courses on Oahu. And at the time there were 37 uh, golf courses on Oahu, there's more now, and there's a total of 82 in the in the entire state. And the problem, the, the good thing was you could see, we, we have that, he published it in the Hawaii Audubon Journal, uh, the Elapayo, 
but the range was such that you can't extrapolate and just say, well, this is what we think about a golf course this size would have. Because one golf course he counted only had two and no, and the high number was 68. So anyway, you can't just say, oh, this golf course is this size and it's probably got this many birds. So the other thing we don't know is the exact arrival and departure dates. People say my bird left or, or I saw this bird arrive on this date and no one was ever writing those things down. So we didn't know that. And we don't know how many Kalea spend the summers in Hawaii, how many don't migrate. Uh, the, the captions on the bottom, I wanna say a lot of these pictures are sent to me by Kalea lover lovers, Kalea fans. And I wanted to just remember who sent me the picture and give them credit because people spend a lot of time, some professional photographers are out there really taking beautiful pictures and sending them to me, telling me I can use them in shows. So a lot of these are theirs and a lot are, are mine also. And you'll see Wally and I have shared some too. And so my idea, when I joined Audubon Society um, on the board some years ago, a few years ago, was I did it so I could start the Kalea Count Project with the Hawaii Audubon Society, because I thought that would be a great project. But the, but the question was, will, will people who are giving them names and feeding them and talking about them, will they be willing to actually help us? And so I thought they would, because the, the birds are so... Tang, it's the only place in the world, Wally tells me that the this is our Craig's and my Lanai on the left and our dog. There's a screen door between the bird and the dog, but the bird knew when the screen was open or closed. So she did not come up when it was open and she came up when it was closed. The dog was old and didn't bark or anything, but they're very tame. You saw the golf course, they play miniature golf in Hawaii. And the woman in the center is in my neighborhood and she named her, her bird Plovey and she raised crickets for it. And she would take the crickets out in that box and go, Plovey, Plovey, Plovey. And the bird would come down from the roof and eat the crickets from her, her container, which is amazing. So uh, and the other one on the right is a guy in Laie said he, his brother came to visit and rented a car and parked it in the middle of the Kalea's territory in his yard. And the Kalea spent the whole time fighting with the reflection in the bumper and then running around to the other side and fighting on that side because it thought it was, you know, on the other side. It was, it was hilarious. It's a video, but I just put it still. And then another time, Wally and I were in, I don't remember when we went to Kauai together to recover some Kalea tags. And we were at a hotel in Kauai and the plover was taking a bath in our swimming pool. So they're, so the point is, they're really connected to people. And, and this, was a, this was our banker. I went to the, my bank to wire some money. And she had these, these pictures. And I said, what is this? And she goes, well, these are pictures of my bird. And I, I love her so much. I love him so much. I take pictures different times. And then I, she put it up in the little cubicle where she was working. This is a mosaic in front of a church in Kailua that on, on the main highway, it's, it's huge. It's a really big sign and there's no caption or anything. It's just a picture of our, of one of our Kaleas that someone, some artist made and, and donated to the church. It's just really nice to see when you're coming home. Someone sent me a painting they made. She made, Marianne Long. And this uh, woman sent me this great picture and said, I finally saw some Kalea chicks. <laughs> they're in Hawaii. You said they aren't in Hawaii, but I saw them. And occasionally you'll see one plover hanging out with a bunch of ruddy turnstones, which is another shorebird. But uh, a lot of people have sent me up other pictures and said they've seen Kalea chicks. So, so part of this thing is, um, this is Becky, who lives with one of my neighbors, and she keeps the water under a dish in her front yard so Becky has to drink a water when she wants it. So since they're so territorial and they're so um, faithful to this one area, you see Wally and I share pictures because you've seen this one in his slideshow. This is that punch bowl with one got into another space. But we figured since they're, they're so faithful to come back to the same place that we could, we could actually set up a citizen science study and say all these um, 
these observations that people are making, making record them, write, let's write them down. And so um, Wally and I together with a great webmaster invented Calais account. And as you can see, there's guidelines of how to do it. There's report tabs. There's things about the biology, about the bird. I post news. I'm, you know, when I write something new, when Wally's there, we write what we're doing and take pictures. And then there's the book and the um, contact with, with me. So I made some Kalea t-shirts. We designed t-shirts. It was a group effort for Kalea counters. And we bought some cheap uh, counters or a dollar a piece. So you, if you're going to count a lot, we, we give you a, a counter and then have a, a poster. The bad thing of news was I launched this study in January 2020. So I was my plans. I had all these plans, go to all the islands and go to schools and talk to people. And this was my my flyer we, to hang up and everywhere. And then, of course, I wasn't able to go for two years. So I'm back at it. I'm going now and I'm going to the schools. And this is this is the flyer. We just say, you know, look at the QR code, look at the website. And then um, when you see it, what well, we divided it into little counts and big counts, which are really two things. Some people just have one bird in their yard or one bird that they watch in a small park. And so that's the, 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 the single birds in the pictures are, are little counts. And then the big counts are um, regional parks. We've got some really large parks, resorts in Hawaii. There's a lot of those. This was one place Craig and I counted a hundred and some at, um, Olina. Cemeteries are a great place for the Kolea to hang out. Military bases, which we have to get permission to do, but they're very uh, supportive of, of the study. And this is the Ford Island, which is in Pearl Harbor. And someone from, from the Ford Island sent me this picture. And this is them gathering just before they left. It's uh, April 26th. And she said the next day they were gone. So it's one of the reasons that I know from this picture that we could put in the report that April 26th was one day that year that they left in I don't know, uh, 2016. So it's nice to be able to get this, in, this information that people are noticing and, and actually write it down somewhere. And yeah, the, another guy sent me this. This was on the big island in the sort of the, uh, the up country and he sent me a picture of these flock of Kalea that landed on his ranch and uh, wanted to know what they were doing and why they were all together because usually you just see one and they're fighting if they're two together but these were all just probably just landed it was in September so the so we launched the Kalea account we, we really worked hard even though it was COVID it was a way to get outside and walk around and appreciate and get out of your house a quarantine we got only seven golf courses, two on the big island. I went to every golf course and I said to one, one guy said to me, the manager of the golf course said, well, yeah, of course, golfers will count birds because they're just standing there waiting for their partners, you know, to, to tee off. And the other guy, another guy, the very next one said, no way, there's no way these, no one, no one's going to count. So that's kind of a challenge because they won't let me count because we can't, Get around, we can't use a cart because of liability if you're not a paid per golfer. So we're working on that because because I think that would be an enormous um, source of information if we could find out. And Wally did it and said in those days in '92 they just let him ride around in a cart, but no more. So this is what we do on Christmas. This is Craig and I and our niece. And her husband is on Christmas Day. The golf courses are closed, and we just rush out there and count all the births we can on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And so the first year we got this is the number of, um, of individual Kalea reports, not the number of birds, but this was the number of reports that we got. So we asked people to count three times so we can average an area. And it was, um, as you can see, mostly on Oahu, where I live, and so that was probably one of the reasons it, it was so high. So the big, the big point of this, besides getting hard numbers or hard dates, the, the big point that I really feel is really important is education. So we can, people who are interested and want to have questions, they, they can get them answered, but also 
we really need to teach the kids what's happening and what's going on with one of the most remarkable native birds in the state, because all you hear in Hawaii about native birds is that they're extinct. If so many are extinct and these are going extinct or they're gonna be extinct, but these are doing great well. We don't know really how well until we get some more data, but we really, this little girl was showing me Kalea in this book at a, at a dinner party, which I thought was great. Of course, her dad's wearing a Kalea shirt, but <laughs> but still he was teaching her that. And I go to uh, preschools, my favorite, the four-year-olds, they're just so excited about about the Kalea, they're flying it around the room and they're really, really fun. We've been going to schools. Uh, that's one of the things. This is a, an elementary school in Hilo and they had a sign that said, welcome back Kalea when Wendy and I went there. So Wendy took this. The drawing on the right is um, part of a program that we're doing with an artist who's a, a naturalist and an artist, and she is wanting to go around to all the schools. So we're working on writing a grant to pay her so she can go to more schools. Cause you know, there's hundreds and we can't do that. But she, I give a little slideshow and put these pictures up. And then Kate shows the kids how to draw, how to draw a bird and a Kalea. And so we, we just have some really good times with this. This is first grade. Go to high schools, which is a little harder audience, but try to get them, get their attention away from the phones, but we, we, we can do it a little bit. She's a great teacher. And see, senior citizen centers, because they have uh, some of the retirement communities have really big lawns and nice places so they can count they also if they're out walking. So this is the website that uh, we, we have. It's active if you just, Google anything, Kalea, Kalea Count, Hawaii Audubon, uh, it'll come up. We have guidelines. If you go to that, it'll, it'll show you how to do it on the front page. Um, you, you get to choose where you live or where you visit or what you're doing. Uh, you know, for vac we have vacationers in Hawaii who say, I'll be here for three weeks. Can I do this? You know, birders. So this is part of it. And the big thing is a lot of people just write me the, the, their numbers. They say, well, I was at so and such a place and I have this, I have these numbers. So I put them in the report. So they, so I put my contact in there, but that's me. If you get, don't know what to do with any of the Kalea account, they can contact me. Uh, the other great thing is we get bird rescues through the Kalea account website. People contact me and say, I've got a bird with a broken leg or a broken wing. And we have a veterinarian uh, who's fantastic, who, who takes any native birds for free. You can just catch them and get them in there. This bird, unfortunately, we could not catch. Tried really, really hard with a net gun to catch because he could have probably fixed his dislocated leg. But a lot of people called me about this bird because she was in, out in a park. But this one we did catch. She had, she had a, a, a wing that was damaged and someone in the, from the Goodwill store called me and we went down to the parking lot, got it and took it to the vet. So it's a good story. Another thing is uh, photographers and other, this is a biologist friend, acquaintance of mine. And he uh, knew he was working on Kalea. And this Wally says is the only picture ever of a Kalea eating a fish. So we, uh, Robert took a couple pictures that we treasure because um, we didn't know they ate fish, but this was in one of the wetland areas. So that's very valuable too, to have people just know. And then this is Sig, she's here, Sigrid. It's one of our Kalea honor, almost honorary board members of Audubon. She's been friends with Wally for years. She found this bird in the Punchbowl Cemetery, lives near there and goes there very often. And we found out through this, these um, uh, leg bands that the bird's 20 years, 10 months. So we're waiting now, This August to see if he comes back, he'll beat the longevity record. So that's great. Well, cemetery is divided in the alphabetic oh, right. section. And that's why his name is Mr. X. Right. Oh. It's an X section. So there's A, B, C, D. So we when we when we go there, we know where, where to go. But Mr. X, we're all really hoping he makes it back one more time. It's a beauty. Wally well, banded him in 2004. 
There's his bands. He's lost one red one since then. Another thing, I, I, I was going to, to the airport in a taxi and the guy knew read, read my column in the newspaper and he asked me about Kalea. It, a guy I don't know in the taxi. And so we talked a little, he dropped me at the airport. And then about six months later, he, he called me and said, there's a white Kalea at the, uh, at the harbor at um, Kahia. And so we went down there, we named, I named her Blanche. She was a really rare color Kalea. Kalea. She, she wasn't exactly, what do you call it? Not leucistic. It's not leucistic. Not leucistic. It was a, well, another kind. Kalea like that has trouble breathing because it doesn't look right? She didn't make it through the season because there's were 35 cats around my oh. car when I got back to my car at, at the Haya Beach Park. So no, she wouldn't, she, she wouldn't probably breed very well either. She'd stand out. Yeah. So she made it here though. But she did acquire a darker plumage. Uh, a, a little dark. In the spring. But she still was nine, white. She still was pretty white, but a lot more dark than this. Yeah. Anyway, this was flo people flocking to the, to see Blanche while she was there. And speaking of cats, is one of the things that Hawaii Audubon is trying to do is teach people to not let cats roam free. We've got a really bad feral cat problem on, a lot, on all the islands. And so we're getting the word out. It's just, I think it's a mindset to release your cat. Please don't let them. The one on the, the white one on the left lives in Punchbowl and we see people going in there feeding it. So trying, trying to ask people not to do that. It's a hard, hard thing. So anyway, this is what we do. Think every Kalea counts. And when you have one in your yard and you've named them Betsy or Gloria or Jake, mine's named Jake, you really get attached to them. Wally thinks it's okay to feed them healthy food, scrambled eggs or mealworms, which people do. We try to uh, tell them what's healthy and what to feed them. And some of the birds will come right up onto the lanai and wait for their egg. Mine knows me. And so I rush in, microwave a little scrambled egg and then throw our pieces. So. This is our Hawaii Audubon website, which is fairly new that we worked really hard on. It's got links to the Kalea project. And just a quick mention that we are one of 450 Audubon societies in the country, in the US. And we are the only one with a peer review, peer review journal and also with our own book because we have our own birds. And so Pat, who's a member of our uh, board here, takes very, very good care of all the data for the book. So when we update it, all the photo, new photos, everything, we have um, a good database for updating the book, keeping it uh, current. And we, uh, my idea as the new president, I've only been the president for a year, a little year and a half, was we, we hear such negative news all the time. Everyone's so sick to death of hearing how bad people are and how awful we've done to our birds. We have three native birds in Hawaii that are doing great. And one, the one in the center is a white tern and they're nesting and breeding in Honolulu City in the urban areas. And they started out with two in 1961 and we have 3000 now. And so that, that's a great, really big project that also has a citizen science um, component to it so people can report and help the white terns. And we also monitor and have a, a wedge-tailed shearwater colony in the city. So these are the birds that have adapted to human habitation and our, our, our traffic and our lights, and they're, they're just doing great. So really trying to get the idea that some birds are doing okay, they're adapting. And that's, a, that's some good news. So this is one of our white terns. They carry their fish on the outside of their beak. So you can, so this, these are interesting birds for fish biologists also. So they can see what we've got, you know, in the fishery around uh, Honolulu. And there's our wedgies that we all work in love, work with and love. And that's our website. Again, just to remind, if you would like to donate, a little donate button. The t-shirts are on there, these t-shirts these and others in the books. And uh, that helps us fund our Kalea project and helps us help Wally come to Hawaii and work in Hawaii. So, so that's it. That's my uh, little 
citizen science effort. And I just want to say this is Pat and and uh, Sig at the Punch Bowl, having a wonderful time with Wally this year. We're still working on this project where we banded and tagged 30 birds, which has really kept everybody quite busy. And I just wanna end with saying that I, when I was here five years ago, Wally was holding this bird in the car and Paul, Paul was here and, and he held the bird up to me and I, I took this picture. So it's me, that's me with the summer solstice sun behind over my shoulder on my 70th birthday. That was my birthday. And I said, when I'm in the eye of a Kalea, life is really, really good. So, so it's a great way to start my 70s. Thank you. Life is good. Yeah, life is yeah. good. Yeah, Cherry. I have a question. Yes. I, I don't want to make a contentious comment, but I heard you use the word native bird three times. Isn't a native where you are born? Well, we have, I think it's prop, proper to use it for species. Because I've been in Hawaii 60 years, but I was born in California. So I'm a native Californian who lives in Hawaii. And it seems to me if these little guys are born in Alaska, they're just having a nine-month um, vacation. <laughs> well, we think they're Hawaii natives because they spend nine months out of the year there. <laughs> I understand that. Right. 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 That's right. right. So it's you want to know where their residents, we say, well, they spend most of their time in Hawaii. So. <laughs> I would submit that that the, where you're born is a human attribute. And these are birds that come naturally to the islands. They are not brought by man and they leave naturally and they come back. So I, I think it's a mixing of human and human and animals, animals right, 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 right. Yeah, anything that gets to the a place naturally is called native, right, Paul? I would uh, turn to messaging on answering that question and draw attention once again to the fact that these birds are long distance migrants, they're really world citizens, and that's what oh. they found being through that life. Right, they are world citizens, yes. Yes. Is there any collaboration between Alaska, Hawaii, and the South Pacific Islands where they will? Have any well, yeah, the, the um, a, a woman named Lee Tibbetts from um, Anchorage is Fish and Wildlife, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. she's she's worked with Wally for years. I yeah. Yeah. oh yes, Geo, 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 geological survey. Yeah, is there any I don't know about the South Pacific. Do you know? Is there a sense of where most of them go? Does the majority go to Hawaii or the majority go beyond? Yeah, I'm. Yeah. Majority go beyond the Hawaii population is probably smaller than the the other one, the Asian. But yeah. What about in Russia? Do you think he's looking at all that? Yeah, that yeah. Thing? I don't know anybody who is. It's probably not a good time to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for inviting us. We we really you can see we're a team. We're the Kalea team, and we've uh, really thank. Wendy, who's a board member for um, organizing a, a trip to Nome, that we get to share our fun with you. So, are the thank eggs you. laid hatching this year? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Oh, no, just Yeah. Okay. So, so bad. Sorry. Well, that's okay. We Wally's got great pictures, as you can see, of the chicks. So, we'll see that. So, so um, we've got one more day. <laughs> yeah, love to. Love my to. my question comes from from working and living up here, it's interesting that Hawaii has such a, um, you guys are okay with feeding wildlife. That's not a problem. Hawaiians don't see that as a problem for your wildlife, wildlife. Well, I wouldn't say wildlife. I would say Kalea only. <laughs> okay. So the, that particular bird. They know, they know the person in their house of the yard. Well, no, so, but I mean, yeah. isn't it? No. Is that okay? Is that all right? Up here, it's very, oh, would be so. very different. Well, I think so. And no, no, but I mean, up here, yeah. I think we would find that. Some people throw seed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, some people throw so. seed, but for half the year or for the time they're up here, it's just very interesting. I don't know. That's what a good it, question. But you know, the um, National Audubon, the, the uh, Humane Society, the mm -hmm. National Humane Society, 
uh, RSPB, the, the British, big, enormous British bird organization, all have what kind of seed to put out, what kind of bird houses to build, how often to feed. And I've looked into this, but That's there's feeding of birds worldwide. Right. And I saw one Australian study that a guy did from Brisbane who said, he did a survey and said, should you feed birds? What well, should you feed the, the birds? And uh, it's like 90% said no. And then he went around and said, how many feed birds? 90%. <laughs> so, so it's a thing that said, well, we're, we're not supposed to feed birds, but I, I really love doing it. I'm going to do it. Bird feeders here, no? don't, you know, yeah, but it's, feeders? it's actually for, it's an interesting conundrum because we yeah. have it, it is against the rules to do that. Really? To feed yeah, bird feeders. to feed wildlife. Right. So yeah. how you how to feed wildlife? How you define wildlife? So it it's just something we don't typically would think of when we're remote. Our our little hab, our footprint of communities here is pretty small compared to what's going on out there. So it's it's interesting because I would never think that that's something that could be. And so my question is, what do they eat? You were saying you put egg out. People make they eat everything that's their crops. natural no, but that's their you said roaches yeah that was every, a good one roaches well, earthworms everything and that crawls everything that crawls so insects and yes, worms spiders, spiders. Spider. okay centipedes, centipedes. A very large centipedes okay are all right and well, there, there's impacts for feeding wildlife that we consider around here, uh, like that. You know, you don't want to be making animals come in. No. And you don't want to be making animals dependent, you know, those kind of things. So it's just very interesting because yeah. I think Hawaii, wow, Audubon, right. you know, it's, it's, I never would have thought of that. Essentially, everything they're eating in Hawaii is specifically. Very interesting. It's, it's not, uh, you know, we talk about mosquitoes or centipedes or earthworms, all those things, they're not native to Hawaii. So it's already an extraordinary human altered environment. I see. Um, so, so they've adapted yeah, to humans thank and you. also to all the introduced uh, insects and invertebrates that we've introduced. It, I don't know that there's much na native food for them there. And I read in your book that they started coming there from around 1000 AD when the Polynesians had already that changed the environment there. Right. So, all right. Yeah, very interesting. So you wouldn't go yeah. there if it was right. in its natural habitat. And, right. and to get back at that question, are, are you guys going to talk to eventually maybe kids in the school when you come up to no? Well, we love to, you know, because I think it's I'd pretty interesting. To. There's all yeah. these different names for the bird that might be right. just interesting in itself. We'll do um, that. Susan, did you have, or Orland, did you have, you had mentioned you had the name of the plover in Yupik, St. Lawrence Island, Yupik? Yeah, it might be Dorik. Dorik. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Dorik. Is that what they say? Dorik, Dorik. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and that's the yeah. Guy. Yeah. And some of your native dancers to come up with a dance on both sides. Mm -hmm. nice. That when you go into the school, the kids start kids to mimic. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> the parents do a and they get dance. Close to a nest. Hasn't, to hasn't there been recently some cultural? Um, the school children went down to Hawaii for to go to your. There's a Hawaiian culture. Camp. Well, we had the Connecticut Maori dancers coming up here and getting with the King Islanders. That was the one. That but I mean, I think just a few years ago, I thought there was like a dude. I don't remember that. Yeah, you might want to check on that because yeah. I think there's already like a um, connection with the high school. They went down and did the Hawaiian culture. Does anyone know? Yeah, I just think, wow, somebody could could take that another step further and maybe bring that connection even stronger. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? What do our birds eat here? Anything that anything, crawl, creeps and crawls. Anything they can catch. So lots of mosquitoes. And of course, um, uh, crowberry, the little uh, 
various, very couple different kinds of berries out here. Oh, there that, that's a big deal too. They survive with last year's berries that they're getting. Actually, yeah. that's, oh, survival, actually. that's a survival food in the, in the uh, when they arrive in the spring, probably the free thrive when they first arrive, very important food source, I think. Mm -hmm. Last year's berries. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, and for those in the audience, you might want to, I don't know, we've we've kind of gone over, so we're we're chugging along, but um, don't forget to give um, Susan some love here in the chat. Thank you. And it's a Kalea book. Should we, is this prizes well, for the group? Oh, it was a it's gift for the center. For the Northwest for Center, Center. Yes. yeah, that's wonderful. This is we'll the Bird's for... book. Yeah. So when you come wonderful. to Hawaii, you know, what you see, we have a lot of introduced birds. The great big question to our introduced birds is, is this bird native or why is, and Alaska. is it um, <laughs> just say it's somebody bring it but the great thing is in the book that I look all the time is where's this bird from it's Brazil or Asia or something so and this is no cards all right we'll put this oh birds. wow we'll give this all to Northwest Topics. Campus except maybe this and stickers and all right yes well hawaii is very generous Thank for those you. online they gave books and stickers they have a lot about their birds that are also our birds so it's kind of a i think it's something that might need to be uh brought yeah. together i yeah. think everybody could learn off each other on um on your this bird that is shared between both ends of the spectrum here i have a totally non-bird question carol suggested that i bring it um she and Carol. Andy sent us up um, Anvil Mountain today, and we found what looks like tar, but none of us know what this is. Is it one of these from Nome? Is it geologist? Or is it from yes, any idea? We have questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, people okay, can take know. a look for take yeah. a look at that when Thank we you. end. Yes. I think our Pacific, I mean, uh, bristle bite curly buds will go to your islands. Yes. Do you claim them as native? Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to come together because I think we're a lot. We don't want to claim them. Yeah. Yeah. No, we can but, all claim them. Yeah. We can claim them. We should all come to, about how we share them. Actually, I think that's yeah, a pretty cool message. Yeah, we have birds just really coming to Hawaii to see some of the shorebird species. No, oh, someone sent a picture. They're small, so we know exactly where they are. Yeah. One sec, everybody. Can you? We're still, we're still listening to the speaker answer questions, just so you know. It's okay. Well, we actually have on the um, on the Zoom. Thank you, Olin. We see that he's. Um, I'm going to try to make this bigger. Is that going to come? So Orlin has a picture. All right, let's do this. Stop share. Share screen. He took yesterday. And have at camp. Is that right, Orlin? At camp. So there's is who is that? Is that your plover? Book. Nope. I think it was smaller, but I thought I'd share it because it, it looks like one of them. There are Dariks yeah. here. That's a Darik with the word the bird they were talking about, the Darik. What is this? You can some let's see. Kind of. Sandpiper, I think. You've got them on the run, Orlin. They're going up to take a look. I can't. I can't make it. Um, we've got a lot of birders here, but they're having a discussion. It's a shorebird. It's a shorebird. Well done, Orlin. You got them on the run with that one. Yesterday. On the on the uh, west side of St. Lawrence Island, halfway down. Yeah, it's on a rock. It's on a rock. Yeah. I'm, yep. In the shore. <laughs> yeah. What's in the foreground, Orland? There's like, is that a dead sea lion or walrus or what? Oh, I think that's my wife and her camel deck. <laughs> Look at no, look at. <laughs> I might say it, have it. Say it again. <laughs> Gee, holy cow, you're like, I made him laugh. What did you say? 
Are you saying it? No, that was my that's my wife. I think she was oh, I see. Well, looking I down at her on the rock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now they got all confused. <laughs> they thought it was uh like a because of the camo. Like more. they like yeah. the camo. All right. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Orlin. That's pretty neat. Uh, we got people still coming yep. up to the screen to take a look and figure that one out. Now, remember, this mm. is on the west side of St. Lawrence Island, so it it they can get all kinds of very interesting um, Eurasian birds. I don't know what you what you've got yeah, that peg for twenty three miles. Rock sandpiper Probably. is the is what they're thinking for that one. You, they want ah, you to come up and identify. Yeah. yeah. So um, um, that's great. Thank you, Orlin. And thank everybody for coming. I think we are out of questions at this point. All right. So I think people want to visit at this end. We're not going to have straight science for a little bit. Orlin, I'm coming to the neighborhood and I'll, I won't talk about that here, but um, I won't be in Gamble. But anyway, I'm coming out, hopefully, weather permitting soon. Um, and... And uh, we are going to have the next straight science will be the 20th of July, the 20th of July. And we're going to have a harmful algal bloom update by the researchers. We're going to have a review of what happened last year. And for the people in the room, this region experienced the largest, most persistent and most toxic harmful algal bloom of Alexandrium, which produces paralytic shellfish poisoning nationwide ever. So this is something we've jumped right out of the we're, we're going down the road from zero to 60 pretty quick in this. And um, there's a lot of interest and we have, we're gonna have an update on some of the monitoring that's been trying to get going up here, as well as a review of what actually happened now that they've had time to uh, analyze all their samples and things. So it's very important for the region. And if you're interested that the next straight science, July, the evening of July 20th, which I believe is also a Thursday. With that, thank you all and thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time.